The visitation of the Savior always takes the highlight and the the forefront. The spotlight's on that in this week's reading block, as it should. Uh, We should always put the focus on the Savior. To begin, though, I would like to discuss the context of what happened, what took place before the Savior shows up, and what his message is. So uh, this week's Come Follow Me reading is 3 Nephi, uh, chapters 8 through 11. So if we can take a look at a few things here, go to chapter 8, please. Uh, Verse 1, we know that Nephi is the record keeper. Let me show you a couple things of how we know that and what's going on here. It says in uh, chapter 8, verse 1, We know our record to be true, for behold, it was a just man who did keep the record. Well, if you click on the word just, the reference goes to 3 Nephi 27. Now, in 3 Nephi 27, it says, And it came to pass that he said unto Nephi, Bring forth the record which ye have kept. Now, here, even though this happens later in that visit, we learn a few interesting things about the Savior and his uh, belief with records. They're important. He reviews the records. And he notices in, again, this is 3 Nephi 23, that the record of Samuel the Lamanite isn't complete in there. He testified of the resurrection and so forth. And in verse 11, he said, the Savior says, How be it that ye have not written the thing that many saints did arise and appear unto many and did minister unto them? And verse 12, Nephi remembered that this thing had not been written. So the Savior says, okay, read or, or add this to the record. Verse 14, Now it came to pass that when Jesus had expounded all the scriptures in one, which they had written, he commanded them that they should teach the things which he had expounded unto them. So Jesus gathers this record and then has has them add to it things that are missing, and then he expounds on that record. I think it's just kind of a beautiful thing about our records and so forth. So let's go back to chapter 8 now. Third Nephi chapter 8. We know it's Nephi who's keeping this record. And verse 2 tells us it's 33 years have passed away, and it's in the first month of of year 34 that, that's in verse 5, that the storm hits. Because people in verse 2 are looking forward to the signs, but there's still doubtings and disputations. That's verse 4. But verse 5, the storm comes. And this is not only the storm of the century, but this is the storm of not even the millennia, but maybe of Earth's record, maybe until it's about to hit us again, possibly, right? Because remember, last week we talked about that everything that's taking place in the Book of Mormon before the coming of the Savior will be a type of what will take place at the end. So let's just take a look at a couple things with this storm and what takes place. And verse 6, the earth shook. Verse 12 tells us the whole land changes, including whirlwinds. In fact, verse 16 tells us these whirlwinds carry people away, and they never hear of them again, never see them again. Uh, What's a whirlwind? I'm not sure. Is it a hurricane? Is it a tornado? Maybe both. Uh, This is a big storm. Verse 14, we hear that cities were sunk. Burned, buried, and he specifically mentions a few by name. Let's take a look at some of these. Now, as you can see here, there's cities that are burned, cities that are sunk, and cities that are buried. And he mentions these three by name, Zarahemla, Moroni, and Moroni. For whatever reason, he emphasizes those more than once. But we also learn that there's a whole list here. So I'm just going to put this list up, and you can take a look at it as you go through your your, your scripture block, you can see that these cities are mentioned by name and what the Lord has happened to them. And he tells us why, too. So, uh, again, in chapter 8, verse 21, there's no light. That's the sign. Remember, the sign of the birth, the Savior coming into the world, is light. But when he is crucified and he leaves the world, the sign is darkness. Verse 23 tells us that in America, 
It was three days worth of darkness. Now, in the New Testament, in Jerusalem, that area, it was three hours of darkness before the night came. But here it's three days. So let's go to chapter 9. In chapter 9, there is, the uh, in verse 2, woe, woe, woe. I want to make sure we understand what the word woe means. It's an expression of grief, pain, sorrow, misery. And in the scriptures, it uses it woe, and sometimes it says woe, woe. But in the few instances, there's the triple woe. And here it's given right here that woe, woe, woe unto this people. Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth, except they shall, be, shall, except they shall repent. Right, what's going to happen? Well, cities will be burned, sunk, or buried. Or maybe a, a combination or maybe multiple other events as well. I, I just find it interesting. This is a screenshot of the United States today. Uh, each little circle represents a wildfire that is a wildfire that is currently burning. Uh, pretty remarkable. It makes it look like the whole West is on fire, and maybe rightfully so. There are a lot, and every year there's a lot of wildfires. But it'll be interesting to see how many cities are burned by fire. Uh, here is a screenshot this morning of the Atlantic Ocean. You'll notice just currently there's three named storms. So, I don't know. It's pretty impressive of what's going to happen. But more importantly is the Savior's message isn't about destruction. I really find it's about mercy, which as I just you have to pay attention to this because if you read and read and read, and just by the sheer number of verses, you'll see nothing but destruction. But if you'll go to chapter 9, verse 14, I just want to read this one verse. Well, the verse before, repent of your sins and be converted, that I may heal you. Yea, verily I say unto you, if ye will come unto me, ye shall have eternal life. Behold, mine arm of mercy is extended towards you. His whole message here isn't about destruction. It's about follow my warnings and I will give mercy unto you. I will heal you. I will protect you. Now, at this time, the voice of the Lord is sharing this to all of the people, all of the inhabitants. And he tells them in verse 19 that the, the, this is the end of blood sacrifice. His blood was the last blood to be shed for sacrifice. But verse 20 tells us what we should sacrifice. A broken heart and a contrite spirit. If you do that, notice what it says in verse 20. I will baptize with fire and with the Holy Ghost. So, we just saw a list of cities burned by fire. But he says if you get baptized, again, water coming over you, buried with water, then fire will come upon you. So everybody's going to be buried or have, and have fire on them. You just choose if you want the Savior to do it symbolically to cleanse you. Baptism, the Holy Ghost, or literally because you reject his commandments. Fire buried, uh, earthquakes, so forth. Well, let's go to chapter 10 and verse 1. Behold, it came to pass that the people of the land did hear these sayings and did witness of it. And after these sayings, there was silence in the space in the land for the space of many hours. When a major event takes place, do we take time to have silence? I just want you to think of the power of quiet reflection and pondering. Now, I, uh, at, I was at a young adult activity this week, and I was there with uh, visiting some people. And, and one of the ladies, the branch president's wife, she's fabulous. She shared with me the power of silence. Quiet that when a question's been asked, we really should have quiet time to ponder that. When an event takes place, have quiet time pondering it. She says today, kids don't know what boredom really is. And she goes, but it's good for them. Because the second they have some quiet downtime, nothing's going on, they pick up their phone and they check some app, whether it's social media or some form of entertainment. She goes, there's constant entertainment. 
you get in the vehicle. Sometimes it's just to go down to the street to the store and they're on their phone or they're watching a movie in the car. There's never a time when there's nothing going on. She shared with me that this lack of boredom, see, they think they're bored all the time, but take away all of that. We take away their time to be creative and to have quiet time and pondering time. She goes, creativity is fostered when there's nothing to do. Kids have to do something. For example, you put some little kids in a room with no electronic devices. They start to play. They start to create. They build forts or they play with toys. They start to make believe. That is healthy time. But if you give them an electronic device to fill up that time, they lose that creativity. So in this case, they just had these wonderful experiences. In our modern world, people would start uh, checking out social media and see what everyone else has to say about it. Maybe look at their pictures, right? What did they say? But what really needs to happen is silence. Do you and I take time, both individually and as a family, to have silence? Be bored in the terms of our youth and kids, right? And let that reflection take place. For notice what it says, many hours. We're not talking just a, a few minutes to say we had some quiet time, but hours. Well, I think it's interesting in verse 4, he repeats this. It seems over and over and over. Uh, verse 4, he does that analogy, and it's in the Doctrine and Covenants. It's several places here where he says, I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chickens. Now, if you've ever had chickens, it's kind of fun to watch a, a little baby chickens. Little chicks. The hen doesn't go out and gather the hen opens up her, her wings and the little chicks run underneath there. So in this case, the Savior is gathering us, but he's doing it by extending his arms. And we gather underneath him where we're safe from cold, from rain, from the enemies. And the question is, are we gathering? And he says that over and over and over. over. Verse 5, and again. How oft would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings? Yea, O ye house, O ye people of the house of Israel who have fallen. So I, we have the same offer today. He has opened up his arms and we are to gather underneath him where it's safe. Uh, chapter 10 verse 12 tells us something very specific. Uh, let's do 11 first. And thus far were the scriptures fulfilled which had been spoken by the prophets. I want to highlight the word prophets because we're going to use that multiple times here in the next minute. Verse 12, And it was the more righteous part of the people who were saved, and it was they who received the prophets and stoned them not. Verse 13, They were spared and were not sunk and buried, drowned, burned, and so forth. You check out those same words over and over and over. So again, the key to be safe is to follow the prophets. That is how we know where the Savior is and his arms are extended, that we know where to gather for safety. So a lot of people, you know, they'll read this, and especially younger people, they'll, they'll be fearful. They're like, what's going to happen? I'm going to be burned or buried or whirlwinds will carry me away. No, the more righteous part of the people will be gathered. And how will they gather? Where will they gather? When will they gather? Well, they're, if they're following the prophets, they will know when, where, and how. So let's go to chapter 11, which is the highlight. It's the voice. You, you've read it. You've heard it. Study it again. You'll find new insights every time you study it. I just want to take you to uh, verse 7. This is the Father, which we have had President Nelson teach us over and over when he says, hear him. Here's the Father telling the people to hear his Son, Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice the words that the Savior says, verse 10, his first declaration is his name. Behold, I am Jesus Christ. But what's next? I want you to read it. 3 Nephi 11, verse 10, Behold, I am Jesus Christ. His very next phrase, 
whom the prophets testified shall come into the world. The Savior's first announcement after declaring his name, his introduction, is he's validating his prophets, whom have been stoned and, and burned and killed and taken away. So I don't see anything different happening when he comes again. There might be all these destructions and turmoil, but the more righteous of the people will be saved. The Father will declare his Son. The Savior will show up. He will introduce himself, and he will then validate his prophet, whoever it is at that time. He will introduce him to the world. And I think most of the world is going to be a little surprised about who that is. It'll be the president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the one who holds the keys and the authority to uh, conduct the affairs of the Savior on the earth at this time. That personal recognition. Now, with that, there are people who are fighting against the prophets today, and I want to share one more verse with you. This is 1 Nephi chapter 11. Remember, Lehi had his great vision. Nephi prayed about it and wanted to know what happened in that vision. 1 Nephi chapter 11 verse 34. In this vision, and after he was slain, remember he sees the Savior being uh, resurrected, slain, killed and resurrected. After I saw him, he was slain, I saw the multitudes of the earth that they were gathered together to fight against the apostles of the Lamb. And thus were the twelve called by the angel of the Lord. So we're going to see a clear division in the latter days. It might not between be between two political parties. It might not be between two nations. But you will see a division of those who are fighting against the words of the apostles and those that will be there to support him. So here is my my testimony uh, with this, that in the latter days, in the end, there will be those who sustain the prophets, whether they're perfect men or not. The men and women that sustain and lead our prophet, they will be the more righteous. They will be the ones that will be allowed to hear the voice of the Savior and witness and see and feel and touch uh, the hands of the Prince of the Savior. That is they who get to do this here in Third Nephi. So enjoy that. Follow the prophets. Even if you disagree, uh, I don't want to be on that side as we go through this uh, end of the world. Uh, because if I don't see it the way the prophets see it, I'm probably not seeing it from the right viewpoint. I need to step back and ask Heavenly Father how he sees it and why his prophets and apostles see it that way. There's a power in that. Now you can continue to read 3 Nephi 11 and study what the Savior says. Make the focus all about him and the words that the prophets have declared. And then next week, we will look at 3 Nephi 12 through 16. Have a great week studying your scriptures.